This BYU Forum address with Andrea Thomas was given on January 28, 2014. Good morning and welcome to today's Forum Assembly. My name is Brent Webb and President Samuelson has asked me to conduct this forum today. We're delighted to hear from Andrea Thomas, Senior Vice President for Walmart Stores U.S. Her talk today is entitled, Make a Difference in the World. She previously served as Senior Vice President for Sustainability at Walmart, where she led the environmental sustainability, women's economic empowerment, and healthier food initiatives for the company. Prior to joining Walmart in October 2007, our speaker was Vice President for Global Innovation of the Hershey Company, where she was responsible for platform innovation for the company's portfolio of global brands. She also spent 13 years at PepsiCo working in brand management, innovation, and retail marketing. Andrea Thomas holds a bachelor's degree in mass communications from the University of Utah and a master's degree in business administration from Brigham Young University. She received an honorary doctorate of humanities from the University of Utah in May of 2013. She is a member of the Board of Trustees of Children's Miracle Network Hospitals and a member of the National Advisory Council for the BYU Marriott School of Management. Andrea and her husband, Kyle, have three children and live in Bentonville, Arkansas. Would you please join me in giving a warm welcome to Andrea Thomas. Thank you. It's a real honor for me to be here today. The last time I was at this podium was almost 21 years ago when I was graduating from the Marriott School of Management with my MBA. I was asked to give the student address that day, and I remember spending a lot of time thinking about it. I felt the responsibility of representing my fellow students well. We were at a tremendous inflection point in our lives, and while I learned a lot as a student, I was even more aware of what I didn't know. I knew I wanted to make a difference in the world. I just didn't know what that looked like. And could I really do something that would matter at a broad scale? I was getting ready to leave my lifelong home in Utah and move to Wichita, Kansas to begin my marketing career at Pizza Hut. While I knew that pizza wasn't going to change the world, I thought it was a great place to start. I was excited to work on a nationally known brand within a well-regarded company. I thought that if I could start working with really smart, motivated people, something might rub off on me to help me figure things out. You can learn so much about what to do and what not to do from observing and interacting with others. Before graduate school, I had kept my world pretty small. It didn't really occur to me that there could be life for me outside of Utah. My parents had lived in Utah nearly their whole lives, and I stayed very close to home for school. It was time for me to expand my world and learn from people who weren't like me. And my life is so much richer because of those relationships. Life can be a great teacher if you allow it to be. Over the course of my career, I've had a lot of choices to make. Many of you are facing really big choices about marriage, your major, job opportunities, where you're going to live once you graduate, or when you're going to start or expand your family. While some of the biggest choices in life happen early on, we continue to make choices throughout our lives. Sometimes it can be daunting when you're facing a big decision that you know will have a lasting impact on your life. But we are fortunate to have access to divine direction. I love what DNC 1113 says. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I will impart unto you of my spirit, which shall enlighten your mind, which shall fill your soul with joy. I have entered into what I like to call the endure to the end phase of my life. I have already made most of my big career decisions. My husband and I have been married for 26 years. Our kids are growing up and starting to go out on their own. 
I'm happily settled at a company I love, so I'm hoping not to have to make any big career-changing decisions. In 2 Nephi chapter 31, verse 20, it tells us, Wherefore, ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. Enduring to the end spiritually is a lot like enduring to the end temporally. You can get into a groove, put your head down, and press forward. Or you can have a perfect brightness of hope, a love of God, and of all men. If you search the word endure on Google, it says to suffer patiently or remain in existence. Neither of those definitions sound too inspiring. I would rather think of enduring to the end as an invitation to make a difference in the world. Have you ever had an experience where you feel like something you did made a real difference to someone? It feels great, doesn't it? What if you could put yourself on a path where you left brightness, love, and hope behind in your temporal pursuits as well? Wouldn't that make enduring to the end a lot more fun? I have a few ideas that can help you discover ways to, to make a difference in the world. First, make your world bigger. Second, don't think or talk, act. Third, have passion and courage. And fourth, hold yourself accountable to do your best every day. Let's talk a little bit more about each of these ideas, starting with making your world bigger. There's one simple quality that can really help you expand your world, and that is curiosity, which really means thinking beyond what you normally think. You can do this by asking more questions, meeting more people, listening more intently, or experiencing new places. One of the great cultural icons for Walmart is a picture of our founder, Sam Walton, on one knee listening to the associates in the store. More than 20 years after his death, we still hear stories of how Mr. Sam cared about each associate and spent the time to truly understand what they had to say. He was constantly asking questions, going into competitive stores to try to get new ideas, or flying over towns to watch traffic patterns to figure out where to build new stores. Even after he had made millions of dollars, he still got up at 3 o'clock every morning to get to work, driven by a desire to learn or try new things. We do something at Walmart that we call eat what you cook. The idea behind this is to invest the time to truly understand the situation you are trying to impact. For example, a group of our executives who were working on developing our sustainability strategy traveled to the polar ice caps to see for themselves they were shrinking. They brought environmental experts with them to learn what would happen because of this and what Walmart could do to be better stewards of the environment. By experiencing this together, it created a shared language that helped them put together the strategy the company's been working on for the past decade. These experiences that are intended to bring you to a place where you wouldn't normally go to gain a better understanding of a particular topic or issue. This is not something unique to Walmart. I had an eat what you cook experience when I worked at Hershey that really helped me expand my view of the world. I was responsible for global innovation, which largely meant figuring out ways that Hershey could enter developing markets. I had traveled to China and India and the Philippines looking at opportunities to serve what economists were calling the bottom of the pyramid. These are people who live in places that don't have grocery stores, banks, or even paved roads. They can't afford to buy a bar of soap or a bottle of, or a bottle of shampoo. 
They buy sachets that look like ketchup packets that cost a few cents filled with a single serving of chocolate or enough shampoo for a single wash. I had traveled internationally before, but not to these kinds of places. I saw what poverty looked like when I took a tour of one of the slums in Mumbai, India. We walked through Dharavi, a place where one million people crowded into the middle of the city. To put that in perspective, it would be like every person living in the Salt Lake Valley moving onto the BYU campus. There was no running water and none of the creature comforts you and I are accustomed to. They lived in concrete rooms with electrical wires hanging low in narrow corridors. There were no bathrooms, just a small river running along the border that serviced the whole community. I had heard about places like Dharavi, and I knew that many people do not live like us, like we do here in the US. But I was not at all prepared for what I experienced on that hot July day. I was surprised by how industrious the people of Dharavi were. They were working hard, tanning leather, making pottery, baking bread, and refurbishing oil drums. Nothing went to waste in Dharavi. Their very livelihood depended on their ability to make something of value out of next to nothing. People were busy, and they seemed to be happy. They dressed their children in clean, neat school uniforms and placed a high importance on sending them to school. You would think that living in such challenging circumstances, the toll would show up on the faces of the children, but that just wasn't the case. They had the brightest, happiest faces. These children didn't know that they were living in a slum because they had never seen how other people lived. I'm sure they couldn't even imagine what it would be like to run around on a playground or play a video game. I came home with a completely different perspective on life. I realized how much of my life was focused on consumption. As a society, we have a tendency to overindulge and to seek after material possessions. As a Walmart executive, that's a good thing. We sell material possessions. <laughs> but it's easy to get caught up in this. And I also realized how much we waste. Just think about the dilemma we face when we go to a restaurant and order an entree that's twice as big as we need. Do you eat it all and worry about the extra calories, or do you eat until you are full and leave the rest on your plate to be thrown away? Eliminating waste allows the products that are being produced today go so much further. It's estimated that we waste a third of the food that's produced in the world, whether it's spoiled in unrefrigerated trucks on broken down roads or is thrown away when we don't eat the food in our refrigerators fast enough. A more conscious consideration of our consumption habits will help reduce the waste that we produce. One of the things that I focused on in my job leading the sustainability office at Walmart was eliminating waste. We talked a lot about what it meant for the population of the world to reach 7 billion people like it did a couple years ago, and what it would look like when it reached 10 billion, which is projected to happen in my lifetime. One main reason that the population of the world is growing at unprecedented levels is the improvement in mortality rates. There are more children in developing countries living to adulthood. And because of advances in medicine, people in developed countries are living much longer. In addition, there are more people moving into the consuming class in these developing countries. These are all accomplishments to celebrate. But if we don't do something different, we won't have the natural resources to support this many people at the rate of consumption that we experience in the developed world. Gaining a broad perspective of the world will give you an important foundation. But in order to make a difference in the world, you actually have to do something. I can't tell you how many times I've been in high-level forums where the discussion never gets to the action stage. It's much easier to talk about problems than it is to actually solve them. While it's important to gather information, developing and executing a plan of action is the only way you can make a difference. 
When I was at PepsiCo, the CEO used to say that a point of view is worth 50 IQ points. He didn't mean that you had to have the answer to everything, but he encouraged us to come into every meeting with a well thought through point of view so we could contribute to the development of a solution. How many of times have you gone to a class or been in a meeting where you are just a warm body in the room? Actively engaging in our lives and putting the effort forward to ask questions about things so you can learn more and develop a point of view will make your days more satisfying and will increase your impact on the world. I saw a great example of this on another Eat What You Cook trip that I took to Africa when I was focused on sustainability for Walmart. We went to the Luanga River Valley in Zambia in an effort to understand the opportunities for Walmart to build more stores in sub-Saharan Africa. We had just purchased a business in South Africa that primarily sold general merchandise items. In order to expand in areas that were less developed, we needed to expand the food business. When communities become more developed, the people move from farming for their own needs to getting paid to supply the village with what they need. The income that the family gets from selling or trading at the, in the market gives them ability to start buying things from others. When you are just entering the consuming class, you start by buying things like food and soap, not television sets and sheets, which is what we were selling in South Africa. Before you can sell food, you have to build out the supply chain, which meant helping farmers produce the kinds of fruits and vegetables and grains that people wanted to buy. We met with a man who founded a very unique organization called Comaco. It, he has a brand called It's Wild that produces basic staples like beans, rice, and peanut butter. It's very interesting how this organization started. The founder was an elephant biologist from the US who went to Zambia to study elephants there. He was very sad and frustrated by all the poaching he saw, and he wanted to save the elephants by putting an end to it. He observed what was happening and discovered that the reason the men were illegally killing the elephants was because that was the only way they saw to feed their families. He realized that if he taught them how to farm and allowed them to trade their guns and traps for farming equipment and seeds, not only would the elephants be saved, but the community would be stronger. He had developed training modules for farming and basic health and created a brand that was being sold in grocery stores in the bigger cities. They had the more experienced farmers teach and provide support for the farmers that were just starting out. And he was able to develop a way that the farmers could bring their products to market so that they could get a fair price. It was truly amazing to see what the vision of one man was able to create. And when we were able to add the size and scale of Walmart, we could help him make an even bigger impact. 200 million customers shop at a Walmart store globally every week. We work with thousands of suppliers to make the products that our customers want to buy. Writing one purchase order can help a company get financing to build or expand a factory. It can be hard to uh, get your head around the kind of impact that kind of scale can enable. So I'll just try to dimensionalize it for you. If you put one dollar bill down on the table every second, it would take you 15,000 years to count out the amount that Walmart sells in one year. But by focusing on the numbers, you really miss the company's purpose. I came to work at Walmart because of the mission of the company, to save people money so they can live better. When I was trying to decide whether or not I should move my family to Arkansas to take the job at Walmart, I had an experience that helped me really understand how many people needed help, the kind of help that Walmart could provide. One woman I got to know in my community was dealing with a challenging situation. She and her husband lived on a very tight budget. Her husband was diagnosed with heart disease on top of the diabetes he had been battling for years. She was frustrated because there were so many foods that he couldn't eat. 
she didn't know how to cook for her family. The doctor had given her a whole bunch of pamphlets, but she didn't really understand what she was reading. She needed to save money, and she also needed to help plan her meals. As I was helping her, I realized that going to work for Walmart gave me the opportunity to create solutions to help her and others like her live better. I accepted the job and moved to Arkansas and started working on our private brand business and the Great For You nutrition labeling program that was launched a few years ago to help guide healthier choices. My experience working with her gave me a desire to impact the issue on a bigger scale. Translating an idea or a plan into action takes a lot of hard work. It's important to have passion and courage, the day in and day out commitment to never give up. There are always twists and turns along the way. Life rarely happens the way you expect it to, but you have to keep adjusting your approach if you're going to continue to move forward. I love the Calvin Coolidge quote that says, nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. One of the farmers I met while I was in Zambia was named Veronica. We went and visited her on her farm. She worked with several other women to grow mangoes and mangrove and raise chickens. She provided work for several other women. She was also raising six of her nieces and nephews who had been orphaned when their parents died of AIDS. Veronica had many reasons to give up, but she didn't. Not only did she continue to work for herself, but she lifted up several other families and gave them the means that they needed to survive. As she walked us around her farm, she shared the improvements that she had made and was planning to make. She even insisted on giving us one of her chickens to take home with us. It's a long way back for a chicken to ride. <laughs> She inspired me through her passion and courage. Veronica made a difference to the women and children that she was supporting. You do not need to work for a large company to make a difference. The final idea is to bring your best effort every single day. When I went to BYU for graduate school, I can remember feeling like I was in way over my head. I felt like I didn't belong and that I wasn't smart enough to compete with the other students. Truthfully, I was stressing myself out. Then I decided all I could do was my best. If I was able to go to bed every night knowing that I had given it all I had, I could live with whatever happened. I had never worked that hard at anything in my life, and it gave me the confidence that I needed to compete in business and take on even bigger challenges throughout my career. It's also important to figure out a way to measure your progress. It's amazing how, many times you, how much time you can spend on activity that doesn't lead to anything. Deciding on the metric that you can use to hold yourself or your team accountable is such an important step. If you measure the wrong thing, it could, liver, it could deliver the wrong result. If you don't measure, and you, then you don't really know when you have succeeded. Measuring your progress is a lot like keeping score. You are all very used to how we keep score in school through grades and tests, and you also had to take some sort of a standardized test before you got into college. Once you finish school, the metrics for success can be less clear. A serious look at how you spend your time is a way that you can keep score. Throughout my career, I've been asked how I'm able to balance my personal life and my career. I've reflected a lot on this question and have ended up realizing that balance is about meaning rather than time. When I am fully engaged in all aspects of my life, I feel it's in balance, even if the time I'm spending isn't equally split. When I became a mother, I learned very quickly that when I was with my kids, I needed to be there fully. 
I wasn't able to make a connection with them if I was on my computer or on the phone. So that time didn't count. It's the same with work. If you're, if you're there, but not putting your whole self into your job in the hours that you are there, you will not feel good about your contribution and will most likely not be contributing at the level you could. I recently took a course for executives that taught us it was more important to manage energy than time. We talked about what we needed to do to align our energy investments with our deepest values and beliefs. It focused on body, heart, mind, and spirit to become physically energized, emotionally connected, mentally focused, and completely aligned with our personal mission. We learned that full engagement requires that we stretch beyond, um, we stretch by pushing beyond our normal limits in order to expand our capacity. The things we spend our energy on are the things that we get done. The focus of energy can't be split. We're either focused or we're not focused. This is bad news for everyone here that likes to multitask, myself included. Think about the impact of your actions and don't get caught up in the illusion of progress rather than true impact. Don't limit yourself before you even get started. Give yourself permission to think big. It's an amazing feeling when you're fully engaged and empowered. It takes effort and focus, but the payoff is incredible. I would like to challenge you to choose to make a difference in the world throughout every stage of your life. Enduring to the end should be joyful, full of hope and love. Thank you. This BYU Forum address with Andrea Thomas was given on January 28, 2014.